Hi, everyone, and welcome to Labeled. This is our first Q&A, and it is a new experience for us all to be doing this online. And I'm sure everyone has, has been on multiple Zoom meetings and multiple Skype meetings and multiple whatever screen sharing meetings over the course of time. So, so I hope that this is still a way that we can, we can get good content and good tips out to the world. So, so I'm very happy to be joined with uh, OC87 today. And I'd love if you can give me a, a quick overview, introduce yourself and, and tell us all about the great work that you're doing in the mental health square, uh, sphere. Sure. Uh, well, Brian, thank you so much for having me um, and for sharing a couple of our films um, via Labeled. Uh, my name is Gabriel Nathan. I'm the editor in chief of OC87 Recovery Diaries. And basically, you know, what are we? We're a nonprofit mental health publication um, featuring stories of mental health empowerment and change. And we really do that um, in two main ways. Um, the first is through the personal essay. So we publish one first person mental health recovery essay um, every single Wednesday on our website. It's oc87recoverydiaries.org. Um, and we also produce one short uh, mental health documentary film every month. Um, and we publish that on the site the last Thursday of every month. So one essay every week and one film every month. Um, and really these stories are designed to bust stigma surrounding mental health and, uh, and demonstrate recovery stories of mental health empowerment and change. Cool, wonderful stuff. Um, you know, it's certainly our mission, you know, we're, we're certainly going in parallel and hopefully someday the roads will converge and, uh, and we will end up, as you say, busting stigma and mental health because it, it is a terrible thing that, that we all have to deal with. So, so can you tell me about how yeah. The organization actually got started. What was the the initial seed? Sure. So our publisher um, and founder is a gentleman named Bud Clayman, and Bud um, was a film student at Temple University in Philadelphia, and he was dealing with obsessive compulsive disorder and bipolar, um, Asperger's, and OCD, and um, he ended up kind of falling apart while he was a film student at Temple. Um, he lived in transitional housing for about 10 years and really got his life back together um, to the point where he made a full length film about his mental health recovery called OC87, the major depression, bipolar, Asperger, OCD movie. So it's a full length documentary film. And um, Bud was touring this film around film festivals all over the country in around 2008, 2009. And when Bud would do talkbacks like this one, um, just you know, in a space with actual people, which we will be able to do again at some point, Bud was really struck and moved by how after watching his film, people in the audience were, were moved to share their own story of mental health recovery or the, the mental health experience of a sibling or a parent or a spouse. Um, and, you know, everywhere he went, these stories kept popping up. And so Bud said to himself, God, you know, there's so many people out there who have stories to tell. Um, and by telling mine, I have kind of empowered other people to do that. He said, I, I want to give people a platform to tell their stories. Um, and so he created OC87 Recovery Diaries as kind of an outgrowth of his film um, so that we could tell those stories. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, that's how the site was created. And that's what we do. You know, it started out very informally with three employees meeting at a local Starbucks and kind of posting content whenever we came upon something or it found us. Uh, and it's now grown into an organization with eight part-time employees. I'm a full-time uh, staff. Uh, and, you know, kind of regular content to the point where we have to turn people away and uh, we have an editorial calendar fully scheduled through late November uh, with just stuff ready to go. And, uh, and it's, it's really wonderful how it, the organization's grown since it started. Fantastic, fantastic. Um, as I say, you know, it's just a wonderful thing to, 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 to put your life towards, you know, and help others. It's, it's very beneficial for ourselves. So, so on that aspect, can you tell me how your attitude to mental health has changed over the years? How my attitude? Well, um, 
so I live with anxiety and depression and obsessive compulsive tendencies. And so um, I was raised in a house where, you know, we're kind of like middle class Jewish suburban family where everything is fine and you don't talk about anything that isn't fine. And, um, you know, there's, I joke and I say, even now when I go to visit my parents for dinner, there's a list of things that you don't talk about. Um, like I just bought my father a bicycle and he, the, the text message back to me was don't tell mom, like really about your bicycle. But there's, there's all these things that we're not supposed to talk about for, I have no idea even what reasons, right? But mental health was one of those things growing up. And I remember when I was 10 years old um, and I was super, super anxious kid and forcing myself to stay awake all night long and biting the edges of my glasses and my pencils out of anxiety, telling my mom that I needed to talk to someone and I was dismissed, oh, you're fine, you know? And I, I clearly was not fine. So, you know, my, my house of origin was one of a lot of shame and stigma, I think prevented these issues from being talked about and from help being gotten early. I didn't start seeing a therapist until college when I could decide, you know, I didn't have to ask anyone for permission anymore, right? Um, and I basically haven't stopped going since. Um, I've worked in a locked inpatient psychiatric hospital and been exposed to all kinds of individuals with struggling with suicidality and homicidality and inability to care. And my, from all of those experiences and through working at OC87 Recovery Diaries, my my mind has really been opened to a, a full spectrum of mental health from the provider side, from the patient side, from an, I'm a suicide awareness advocate. So from the advocacy side, I really try to read each submission that we get with eyes that are fully open. And, you know, I'm not going to look at this as a former inpatient provider, and I'm not going to look at this as a peer. I'm going to look at this as a human being. You know, does this, how does this story resonate with me on a, on a human level? Because that's, we're not, and I just listed, oh, diagnoses. I have this diagnosis, that diagnosis. We're not diagnoses. We're not a cluster of symptoms. We're human beings. Um, and whether we're diagnosed or not or whatever. So I think that's, that's the biggest way that my mind has, my perspective has changed, where I really see mental health as just a human thing. We're all affected in some way. You know, yep. um, I hope that answers your question. No, it certainly did. And again, from the end of your answer, that's why label exists, you know, because we're trying to get away from the negative labeling of people. You know, we, we have a diagnosis, but we're not that diagnosis. You know, and we look at all those right. negative why, aspects. Why do diagnoses, why diagnoses exist so that clinicians can get paid. They have to write something down after they see you. And, you know, they can't bill for spending a nice half an hour with someone. You know, they, they have to put something down. Yeah. That's why a diagnosis exists, bottom line. Um, yeah. So the provider can get paid and so that someone can get access to the treatment that the provider believes they need. And and that's, to me, that's where the identification should end. It's, it's much more about being human and what do I need? What kind of help do I need to live a more functional life, really? Of course. Yeah, and we, we because of, again, all the negative labels that come into play, like, um, crazy, psychotic, uh, you know, off their rocker, like all of these, these things, but we don't look at the positive ones because in my experience, uh, especially with myself and a lot of my friends, the creativity that comes out of mental health is phenomenal. You know, the problem solving, the, the conflict resolution, the, the, the ability to move forward in the darkness, especially nowadays, like with the lockdown, with all of the, 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 the COVID stuff, everyone is experiencing some form of mental health now. Yes. Yep. And it could be the first time that they are ever experiencing anxiety or depression and they don't know what to do. Whereas people that have had a lifetime experience of living with their shadows, we have been able to, 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 to exist within this new, new existence a lot easier and, and keep moving forward and know Yes, today is a bad day, but tomorrow is a new day. Right. You know, 
let's have positive interactions, positive communication, so we can all move forward. So that'll lead us into the next question. So the two films that we've shown tonight uh, were the bipolar and punk, and 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 OCD. So I'm sure there have been experiences that you've been involved with when showing these films to somebody. There has been a, a great story, or somebody has talk to you after one of the screenings and it is it has possibly changed their life you know maybe not change their life in that exact moment but given them help to take one step forward in in a new positive direction and do you have any stories like that that you'd like to share i do we actually did a screening of a couple of these films um at whyy which is the philadelphia um public television station um a local pbs affiliate and um, it was a, a live screening event. There were about 100 people there. And we did a Q&A afterwards. And a young woman came up to me, um, big mound of blonde, curly hair, you know, real like, and a real vibrant presence. Like the, the, the personality matched the, the hair. I said, hey, uh, you know, my name's Laura. And um, you know, I've been kind of following the site uh, quietly you know, on social media from a distance. And I've been reading the stuff and I've been watching the films and and I, when I heard that you were doing an event in the city I, I really wanted to come and I'm so glad that I did and I dragged my friend here but I think she had a really good time too and um, she said I have bipolar disorder and I have not been really vocal about it because of shame and um, you know I'm scared like that I'm gonna lose my job uh, you know if my boss finds out I'm bipolar and um, I do this support group online, um, but other than that, like I, I don't really, you know, talk about it. And she said, really, kind of seeing these films and and seeing the people up there talking, you know, really kind of gave me the courage to think about writing my own essay. Um, you know, and at OC eighty seven Recovery Diaries, we make all of our authors. It sounds kind of harsh, but like we make everybody use their real name. Mm -hmm. um, some websites publish stuff that's anonymous. Some will publish stuff by like, my name's Gabriel Nathan. So, you know, by Gabriel N. We don't do that. Um, for the reason really that we believe that there's nothing to be ashamed of and there's nothing to hide from simply by telling your story. And that yep. how, do we, how do we move the needle of shame, you know, by letting people know that it's okay to tell your story um, and, and put, your, put your name to it. And that's how, that's how change happens. So anyway, you know, fast forward, I guess it was two years later, um, I get an email from this woman, Laura, and it's her personal essay. Um, and it was really born that night, two years earlier, when she came to WHYY Studios and saw the films. And um, it, the medical director at the hospital that I used to work at used to talk about planting seeds and um, just casually mentioning something to someone and and walk away and let it sit with them and let it germinate and you know they may not be ready to hear what you have to say at that moment yeah. but they're going to go away and they'll be discharged and you know they'll be home and they'll be doing outpatient and maybe a month or maybe a year from then that seed will flower right so with Laura you know it took that time but all through those two years that the sunlight was coming down and that was being watered and um and she's got a lovely essay up on our site and it's got her full name there and it's uh it's a really cool thing it really is great great uh we'll try to put the link into that so people can go and read that story uh wonderful. wonderful um but it is exactly you know just lay the seeds and that may take two weeks three months six months two years whatever but it's it's wonderful when when you know it sprouts and it blooms it's, yeah. it's gorgeous and uh and then we can get a lovely flower bed that we can all look at and make a lovely picture so um and again moving on from that do you have any tips for somebody uh because again it, it, it one of the biggest steps is to ask for help you know i always say that the two yes. hardest questions is i don't know and i need help um so a lot of people will try to start the journey internally themselves before they even put the hand out or put their hand up or send a text, whatever. So do you have any tips for anybody that's watching tonight that may be in that 
position that they just want to tell their story, even if their only audience is themselves. What, what do you think on that? Well, so I think there's two questions here, really. I think if I'm hearing you correctly, there's, there's one question is, so someone is, is trying to get ready to tell their story or, or thinks they may want to get ready to tell their story in, in a creative way, and let's say in a personal essay. And then there's the person who is struggling and needs help. So there's, those are two very different things. I'm, I want to address both actually. Yep. So the, the first one, someone who's, who's thinking about getting, their, getting ready to tell their story and doesn't really know where to start or how to do it. The advice I always give people is, so like our personal essays are between 1200 to 1500 words, okay? You cannot tell your story in 1200 to 1500 words. Yep. You can tell a portion. Mm -hmm. So I think sometimes people get overwhelmed, like, oh my God, my mental re recovery journey, like how do I even do that, right? Start with a moment, just one moment. Describe sitting in your therapist's waiting room for the first time, what was that like? What was the picture that you were looking at on the wall um, in front of you? I know my therapist, they have it's lighthouses. You know, they all have something that they think is peaceful and whatever. So it's also phallic, but uh, you know, hey. Well, and we all know that- Talk to my therapist of, about that. Yeah, and a lot of uh, lighthouses are all haunted too, so. Exactly, <laughs> right. So, um, so, but, so for me, I might talk, I might start the essay describing the lighthouse, right? Describing the picture and then moving in to what was that first therapy session like um, and talking about that dynamic and was it working, was it not working? Were you anxious, were your palms sweating? All, all you wanna do is focus on a moment in your recovery story. That way you can go into really beautiful detail and tell that part of the story. And I think that really takes the pressure off people. You don't have to tell your whole, your whole recovery story ain't been written yet anyway. Um, so you can't tell the whole story because you don't even know what it is yet. Um, but I really encourage people to, to focus on a moment. You can start at a really dark time. You can start at a really hopeful time. You can start at a time kind of in between. Um, maybe you want to talk about your relationship with medication. Um, how has that evolved? Maybe you want to talk about yoga or, or whatever. Just to, just stick to one thing. Um, and then kind of see what comes from that yep. related to the person who is struggling internally and needs help you know where do you start uh, for me personally i think the, the the place to start is with the recognition that you deserve help and i think that for so many people who are suffering we have this kind of subconscious barrier to asking for help because we believe that we don't deserve it. I've heard over and over and over again from myself, first of all, but from patients at the hospital, from people who I've met through OC87 Recovery Diaries, through uh, suicide awareness advocacy work, I didn't believe that I was sick enough. I, I, did, I wasn't sick enough to need help. Well, I only have depression, but so-and-so has bipolar. Well, I only have bipolar disorder, but they have schizophrenia. So we do this kind of suffering Olympics where we, we um, striate mental health and well, we're, we're only at the bottom. Well, yeah, I experienced childhood trauma, but that was decades ago. You know, shouldn't I be over that by now? We tell ourselves all these stories to mitigate our own need for help. Yeah. Everybody needs help. Let me tell you something, everybody needs help and everybody deserves it. Um, so you don't have to, it, like, would you wait to put a Band-Aid on yourself when, uh, only until you look like nearly headless Nick from Harry Potter and your, your head's falling off your neck? No, like you take care of it when it's a cut, right? Yep. Um, same thing with mental health. Why, why do you have to wait until you're, you know, you're in crisis at 3 a.m. On, on a street corner? Like, it, it doesn't have to get to that point. Um, for you to, to deserve help. Um, so acknowledge that in yourself, that whatever you're feeling is valid. Um, and um, there's all different levels of help available from simply texting or phoning a friend to a peer-led warm 
lifeline to the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline, to crisis residential programs, to outpatient providers, to partial hospitalization, to inpatient, to mobile crisis. There's so many different levels of care um, that are available. Take what's yours. Go, go, go get it. Go get something. Go get help. It's okay. It certainly is. So, well, that, that was a wonderful answer and a lot of tips and a lot of uh, great resources for people. So, uh, as we wind up now, can you tell me what's next for OC87? Ah, what's next? Um, so, we uh, are currently putting together a beautiful film uh, about uh, a physician at Einstein Hospital that really um, it focuses on the putting on of all of her layers of personal protective equipment simply just that she needs to do her job. And by the time she's done, like our cameras went into Einstein and kind of filmed her in a really beautiful way, getting ready for her day. And by the time she's done getting dressed, she looks like she's going to go clean up an oil spill, you know, uh, um, and it's, it's a shocking thing. And she really talks about the mental health toll that that takes on her. Um, doing that every single day and kind of looking like some kind of space creature um, and she carries around a picture of herself so her patients won't be scared so that they know that there's a human being under there and what this is all doing to our mental health. Uh, um, so that is our film. Uh, it's coming out in September. We're doing a, um, a YouTube live screening on World Suicide Prevention Day, which is September 10th um, of a couple short films related to suicide prevention. Um, so we'll have information about that available on our social media. And other than that, we're just business as usual. One essay a week, one full month, like clockwork. And we're, we're very proud to be able to do it, um, you know, even in these times. Fantastic. Um, well, I'd like to thank you very much, you know, for, for taking the time to, to be on Labeled. And again, for the mission that you're doing, you know, uh, it all takes, it takes, well, King Arthur had his night to the round table. And you're certainly one of one of the knights of uh, the mental health round table. So together we can keep moving forward and as you say, bust stigma in mental health. So so thank you very much. Amen. Thank you and thank you for everything that you do. It's it's a joy to be here.